This is the Skin in the Game VC podcast, hosted by Tom Wallace, entrepreneur turned venture capitalist and the managing partner at Florida Funders, along with Saxon Baum, general partner and head of investor relations at Florida Funders. You'll learn from the best about investing in early stage tech companies, so you too can gain the confidence and find the tools that help you succeed as an angel investor. Are you ready to get some skin in the game? All right. I hope everybody's doing well. My name is Saxon Baum. I'm a partner at Florida Funders, and you're here today with the Skin in the Game pod. We have an amazing guest with us, Steve McDonald. Uh, Steve has actually been on the show before, so this is his second time. The first time, though, uh, my lovely co-host Tom Wallace was the one that ran the pod. Today, uh, Tom left me hanging, but so happy to have you here today, Steve. How you doing? How is everything? Great. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, just some background. Steve and I have known each other for probably almost 10 years at this point and always been such an advocate and, and such a fan and, and honestly you've been a great mentor to me and great support of Florida funders. So want to thank you for everything you've done over the years and excited to, to get caught up on, on what's new with Steve McDonald, as we say. Yeah. Great. Uh, you know, I, I wanted to dive in and just kind of get everybody up to speed with your life in the last few years, because beyond your tech investing and beyond, you know, running a few companies, which is, which is pretty usual for you. You did something a little bit unusual and, and you took a year and, and went to Italy. Can you talk a little bit about why you decided to do that? Some of the experiences that you had, and then we can, we can double click on that. Sure. Um, yeah. So, um, last year we spent the last, uh, almost year in Florence, uh, Florence, Italy. And, um, everybody always asks, well, why Florence? How'd you pick it? Are you Italian? Et cetera, et cetera. Now, we, um, my wife and I had always um, aspirationally wanted to spend a year abroad somewhere. We didn't know where. We toyed around with London, Amsterdam, Madrid, um, Rome. But we had a friend who had a, their, par their parents lived in Florence, and they'd had a place there for 20 years. And it was just kind of an easy transition to go into that, in, into Florence. Uh, so we found this really amazing villa that was built in 1520 wow. um, by the nephew of uh, famous Medici, the banker, Lorenzo the Magnificent. Um, great experience. Uh, and we, we, we wanted to do that just culturally, just wanted to get out of the States for a while, um, kind of turn off the U.S. news, um, and just experience something that we had never experienced before. And we had always, we talked about it even before we'd had a child and, and he was going into sixth grade, um, you know, transitioning schools. And we felt like that's the right time somewhere between sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade would be a good, would be a good time to do that. So yeah, we picked up and moved to Florence for a year. It was great. And so how, how was the experience? I mean, was it, was it all positive? There was obviously a lot of change. How, how was it? Uh, it was it was great, and um, towards the end, I was getting a little homesick. I'd had yeah. I'd had enough, but yeah. it it was great. It's really interesting, you know. The United States is um, relatively young, right? And so, especially living in Tampa, where there's lots of new construction, and then you move to a a city, a medieval city that you know is over a thousand years old, right? Um, and you know riding bikes everywhere, running, like literally every single road in, in, you know, moving in and out of Florence is a six foot high, 500 year old stone, stone roll road that it was all horses and carts. And, um, you know, getting in and seeing um, the history of really um, a lot of really kind of modern day banking and modern day art you know, the Renaissance was yeah. was um, started there. Uh, seeing how that moved into current culture and um, and just having the opportunity to, to really, it's a lot different than when you just go there for a week and then you live there for an extended totally period of time. Feeling. Yeah, the food, the food was amazing. Um, and just really just being in an environment that is not what you're accustomed to and, you know, just kind of like, shake you up a little bit, you know, just, it's just different, right? Totally. You got to get used to it. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and 
was the goal to go there and unplug? I know you said unplug sort of from the American news, which I think everybody could could use that at some point. Uh, but was the goal to unplug from a work standpoint as well, or was it still you know keep on doing what you're doing from work standpoint, just do it from from Italy? Yeah, it was more keep on doing what I'm doing, but yeah. from Italy. I mean, there was certainly an opportunity. You're not. Um, you know, as you know, I'm usually a pretty active investor, so I put that on pause for a while. So I wasn't really looking at new companies or new opportunities, but, you know, the boards that I sit on, you know, actively, you know, participating from abroad, which, um, you know, remote work, we're kind of all used to that now. So, um, yeah, just try to stay engaged. Yeah. Um, eventually, one of the, um, when you're there for a long time and you don't have like a place to go and your, your group it does kind of get, you know, a little boring, a little old. So little I was, yeah. yeah, I'm like, all right, you know, this is okay. How much more red wine and how much more pasta <laughs> can I have? And, you know, I've seen the, you know, the Leonardo da Vinci, you know, or the David, you know, a thousand times already. Like what, what's next? Right. Yeah. So. And did you, when you were there, did you travel around Europe or was it primarily staying in, in Florence? No, we traveled. We yeah. went all over Italy. We went yeah. to the Southern part of Italy went to this place, Matera, where people lived in caves, you know, all the way up into the 1960s or 70s um, with their farm animals in there. It was supposed to be, um, like, really bad. Really sanitary. It yeah. Sounds, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, like, it was a 35% mortality rate for kids. They had to really move them out. Um, but then, you know, the Positano down on the Amalfi Coast, yeah. and then we went up, um, you know, went backcountry skiing up in the Dolomites. Oh, that sounds amazing. Um, then went up into, um, let's see, we're Southern Austria. Um, I spoke at a couple different events. So one was in, in Slovenia, um, another in Budapest, um, went over to Portugal, London. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, being able to hop on a little plane, um, Mallorca, you know. Yeah. See all these places that normally you just wouldn't have a chance to. They're so close. And, you know, like Europe is it's kind of like just being in the United States. Like, OK, well, I'm going to go to Atlanta this weekend. Right. It's kind of the same thing. I'm going to go to Mallorca. And when you're there for a while, you can do that. Yeah. Right? It opens that up. Yeah. Uh, what's the tech scene like in Italy? Did you did you kind of poke around there and see what was going on? Yeah, I did. Um, I did. Um, one of my my son's. Friend's mom was the um, uh, consulate general of Florence, so she was like the highest ranking person um, in in Florence, American person. Good and, person to know. Yeah, and yeah. so she had invited me to speak um, a couple different occasions. There's, they actually have um, an incubator there. It's pretty similar to the one here we have in, in Tampa, Embark. Um, so I did a couple of events there and met some entrepreneurs there. Also spoke at a couple of tech startup. Uh, events one the one in Budapest and another in Slovenia um, so got to meet you know some European tech startups and the people that you know are starting these companies so which was interesting but what were um you know I know nothing about European startups except for the large ones the Spotify's of the world Klarna's of the world what were some of the major differences or similarities that you saw maybe from an entrepreneurial standpoint you know at the actual entrepreneur and in, in the business as a whole it's kind of the mindset yeah um it's interesting because culturally, um, specifically Italy, um, culturally, you're, you know, in the United States where it's like, hey, failure is part of the process, right? Totally. And so there's no, there's no negative um, backlash against, a, you know, trying to start a company and failing. In Italy, it's not okay to fail. And it's a, it's a blight on the family name. And so there's a lot of apprehension, which is really kind of crazy because you have like, it's a really big um, machining area. So, you know, they make, they manufacture lots of machine parts, you know, it's Gucci, right? It's Ferragamo. Um, and, you know, all of these like really high end brands, uh, consumer brands. Uh, and so obviously those are entrepreneurs. Yeah. But when you get down to like, you know, most people are not willing to take the risk. And the number one um, feed, feedback, you know, or questions that I would get uh, when I spoke were all centered around, you know, how do you deal with failure? And like here, it's like, okay, well, it's just part of the process. Totally. And um, 
And so it's, unfortunately, it really stifles um, progress and growth in, in Italy. And it's one of the reasons that culturally, like, um, you walk into a restaurant and like half of the people are still taking your orders on, you know, and, and putting it just on a pad of paper. They're just writing it down. There are no electronics. Uh, so it's, it's a little bit of a time warp, which was kind of fun because mm -hmm. you kind of feel like you're walking into the 1970s, you know, the, you know, the technology from the 1970s in the United States, but it's modern day Europe. Yeah. And it's interesting because you would think that that wouldn't be an, what I would think of that wouldn't be a core piece of, of being European is not wanting to fail. And it's interesting that that was the major takeaway because venture capital, we know a significant portion might fail of our portfolio. Did you get any insight on the VC side, what VCs look for in, in Europe and is, is their mindset a little bit different as well? Maybe more conservative based on that point. I think it is more conservative. Um, I think that, well, there's just not a lot of venture capital. There's just not a lot of VC money there. There's, you know, yeah. I think there were just a couple funds that I, and they're small, yeah. relatively speaking. There's like, uh, there was, there was one that I came across, I forget the name of it, but it was much larger fund and more like a growth oriented yeah. fund. Um, and, you know, the other thing that, that, that they don't have that we have here is there's, because of that cultural um, divide, they don't have a lot of angels, so like, you know, the first, there's not a lot of individuals that are checks. willing to take that risk and fa friends and family money are also not, you know, yeah. it's not abundant yeah. unless you want to start a pizza restaurant or yeah, something. I mean, like, hey, you know, yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, here you go. Um, but it was, you know, that was, it was a surprise. Um, and then there, but you know, you do have this segment of, of people that they see that they want to be a part of it. Um, and they're willing, you know, however it is like their parents are, more progressive and um, supportive. And, you know, there is a smaller faction. It's, I, I would say it's kind of like the United States was maybe you know, 30 years ago, as far as people actually moving away from like the large industrial manufacturing sector where you got a job for life and yeah. that's where you stayed. Yeah. Um, and moving into more of this kind of migratory work, you know, work, play, or work attitude. And into into a startup. Uh, so, the and the other thing I would say is it's really interesting because if you go back 500 years, you know, Florence was like the Silicon Valley. Yeah, you know? I knew that it, Florence was known for innovation. It was you know, it you know, like I said earlier, it, they invented the bank, modern day banking system. It was because of the Medici family and the investments that they made in the local community that, that we have like the Renaissance art and the you know the, all of the money that went in to that and the um, commercial trade in all of Europe was centered in Florence. Um, the currency of trade was the florin. Um, and so to see that happen, you know, to, to move from this epicenter of commerce and, and, and ingenuity and innovation to where it is now 500 years later, it's like, it's just, it's, you know, you can kind of see how things evolve and change and, you know, the risks to our local yeah. um, communities that are th those innovation hubs. And, and would you say the the goal for a lot of these startups is to come to America? I mean, is that at the forefront or, or that's not something? Because, you know, Israeli startups, their goal, a lot of them is to come to America, right? And there's, there's a good funding in Israel and there's a great ecosystem. But still, they look at that, you know, getting to Silicon Valley, getting to New York as we've, we've sort of made it. Is there a similar mindset there? Um, I think with a with a with a smaller segment, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, I thought it was interesting that you know the one main um, incubator uh, in Florence that they you know they have programs similar to a lot of the ones here, yeah. But they didn't have real programs around. Um, commercializing in the United States. And they also didn't make it. I would have thought that they would have made, you know, English is the, not just because we're from the United States, but English is the universal language of business. Mm -hmm. And they did not have any emphasis at all on learning English. Okay. And so um, from the few people that I met with that, you know, were so, so to speak, um, pitching ideas, um, 
English wasn't really that much of a focus. And, you know, it was one of the things, because, you know, they're asking lots of questions yeah. and stuff. Well, how do I do this? And how, you know, what? how would I go overseas? And you know, one of the things I have to say is, like, you know, you'd really, unfortunately, have to work on your English because yeah. I can't understand you. <laughs> you know, so. Let's start there. Right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, and it's yeah. going to be really hard to get a, me a meeting. And it's going to be really hard to, you know, internationalize your business yeah. if that, if that's not a focal point for, you know, for what you want to do and how you want to do it. Yeah. So. No, it's, it's interesting. So fast forward, a um, year later, you're coming back to the U.S. How did you feel? Were you rejuvenated, revived, ready to hit the ground running? Or were you, you know, hey, I want to I want to kind of take a step back from everything, you know. Wh where is where is Steve feeling right now? Um, so the one thing that I was really anxious to leave were Italian drivers. And my wife, at the end of the whole thing, she's like, I'm going to get you. you we got to get you out of here. You're going to kill somebody. Like, and I was just like. <laughs> on the road rage side or you oh, the road side? rage. <laughs> and just like, I was like, I was, I was nuts. Like I was losing it. And she's, you know, so it was that I was ready to come back. Cause yeah. it was just, because it, they're just nuts, man. Like you don't even really understand. Like when they say it and it's not even the driving. Cause I like the aggressive driving. It's everything is. Que cazzo, Ivan Fanculo, which is like, you know, what the fuck, or, you know, fuck you, or whatever. It's always like, you know, fuck you, Ivan Van Fanculo, you know, it's everywhere, right? And you're just like, Jesus, you know, and they just, when they're in the, like, it's funny because they're in the, in the regular daily environment, things are fairly slow and, yeah, you know, very relaxed, relaxed yeah. pace, like, oh, you know. Sometimes it might take 10 minutes for a waiter to come over, you know, whatever. They just, you know, <laughs> just chill, you know. But on the road, it's, you know, it's crazy. And I was just like, I was, I was, I'm like, I'm going to kill somebody. So I was ready to come back. You had to get back. I had to come yeah, back, yeah. right? And so, um, so by the time I got back, and so like a lot of those days where there was just a lot of downtime and I had read everything, you know, I spent like four months learning, you know, the last 500 year history of Florence. Okay. I'm ready to come back. I, I need to get back to work. And yeah. so I was ready to come back. You know, this couple of the company, you know, the last um, couple years have not been the greatest for um, some early stage startups because, you know, interest rates and uh, money drying up and, you know, a lot of early stage capital isn't um, as abundant as it was yeah. before I left. Uh, so, you know, getting back and working with, you know, some of my startups and, and trying to really get back in, you know, pick, you know, pull up my sleeves and dig in and try to help these companies. Yeah. And, and happy to have you back, obviously. And one thing that I, I wanted to ask you about was the current market environment. So if, if anybody isn't aware of this, Steve is one of the most active angel investors in the country, I would say with you know, probably a hundred or so investments, I would think, right? Yeah. Uh, you've been doing this, as we were talking about before the show, for about 10 years, investing, mm -hmm. you know, as an angel. Has has the liquidity and the return profile that you thought going into early stage investing, has that stayed true? Or has it been longer? Has some exits been shorter? I mean, just talk about the liquidity in the environment in, in your own portfolio, because obviously as we're seeing across the board of venture capital over the last two years, liquidity has been, has been minimal. Yeah, absolutely. You know, when I first started this, people were talking about a seven to 10 year horizon for, um, you know, monetizing the portfolio of your investments. It's, you know, the expectation seven to 10 years, seven to 10, years. Yeah, 10 year funds typically. Yep. Right. Um, I, that's definitely stretched out. I mean, you know, we're not seeing, we're seeing very, very little liquidity in any, any companies. Yep. Um, and you know, the, the other thing was that with some of the, you know, some of the investments that I invest in you know, are direct, others are through funds or syndicates, um, you know, other people I co-invest with and, um, you know, going into 2020, 2021, you know, there were probably seven or eight unicorns in my portfolio, um, which, you know, fast forward a couple years, uh, fairly highly inflated, yeah. like 99% yeah. in value, you know, like I yeah. think, um, you know, I think one of them is Lime or the other one invested in alongside Sequoia at, 
you know, a huge, you know, multi-billion dollar valuation. It's now publicly traded for under, I think the market cap's $45 million now. It's crazy. I mean, and then, you know, as the money starts to dry up and then you start to wreck, you know, the, the people start asking questions, i.e., um, um, FTX, Sam Bankman fried um, you know, a couple of the ones that I, that I were, were in were like, you know, $7 billion or we don't even know if they're going to make it now. It's just, it's, insane. It, it's a different, it's a different market. It's a different market. But I also think that the companies that, um, were, uh, more prudent along the way and they're still running and they're still growing. Those are going to be the ones, you know, all the, albeit it's, it's, a longer time horizon to, to see a return on those things. I think they're going to come out stronger and better and, you know, hopefully it'll be represented in our portfolios, but it's just right now, it's a little too early to tell. Yeah. And I, I think Florida funders, we've got the the same perspective and you know, our perspective, obviously being on the investment committee and being a, a supporter and investor of ours, great business models, great founders, great teams. If they're running those businesses the right way, those are those are going to be the winners. It might take longer. It might not be the biggest yep. hit initially, but in the long run, you know those those are probably the businesses that are going to succeed. Yeah, the businesses that are focused on preserving cash and and um, selling. Yep. You know, like, got to sell. I mean, that's the lifeblood it's of the a, company. It's amazing how many companies were not. They were focused on fu- raising. Hundred percent. You know, fundraising and not focused on sales. Yeah, we had that conversation with on one of the pods with the Lula twins, uh, right. with Michael and Matthew Vega, in their first startup. They were only worried about fundraising. That's all that they wanted to do. That company failed, and then their second startup, before they even went to fundraise, they were getting LOIs and generating revenue. And that second startup is Lula, which is now probably the fastest growing company in the state of Florida. Yep, might even be be the country. Uh, okay, interesting. And and another thing that you have a very interesting perspective on is you've invested in many ecosystems around the United States. So unlike some local investors that have only invested in the Southeast or in Florida, you've invested in Silicon Valley, you've invested in New York, Boston, Austin. Uh, have you have you seen major differences in those ecosystems from entrepreneurs? And, and what are those major differences? And is, is one better than the other? Or are they just different? Um, well, I will say that, you know, Silicon Valley, San Francisco, the, the concentration of talent in that area is, you know, has, and even to right now continues to be probably, you know, tenfold above most of the other areas. Um, I think that's changing just because of the political um, and social environment of San Francisco, but, um, there's still a lot of really smart, talented people in that area. And there's just, it's just that it's what happens in those areas is you just get the network effect of smart entrepreneurs. They have exits, their employees were with, you know, smart companies. They want to leave. They maybe they're older or they've got a family. They don't want to, you know, they've got investor networks. They've got employee networks, uh, talent networks. So they do stay, yeah. you know, it's very sticky when that yeah. happens. Um, the remote work, you know, kind of, um, you know, jolted some people out, maybe leaving that area and recognizing that, Hey, I don't have to pay $10,000 a month in rent. I can for a decent place. (laughs) Yeah. And I can move to Austin or those Tampa or Miami or whatever, no income tax and great quality of life and friends and friends move over there. But, um, you know, I think that, um, there are differences, you know, I, and I, I don't do much on the East coast. Um, I, one of the companies I, or groups I invest with is, um, one way ventures, which focuses on immigrant founders. Um, and they continue to do great. We still find a lot of talent, um, with the immigrant, um, founder population. So, you know, it's, well, the other great thing, obviously, has been great for Florida. Absolutely. Right. The exodus has been great for yeah. us here in Tampa and Miami. Yeah. And, you know, Florida funders, we go down to Miami and, you know, getting hell snap is crushing it. Lula Absolutely. is crushing, crushing it. it. You know, so, yeah. um, you know, hell snap is another one of those, like probably truly one of the fastest growing companies, at least in Florida. For Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And especially in that industry. Yeah. And, and they're a company uh, that, that really has gone through the ups and downs they're now in a position where they're they're scaling like wildfire. Yeah. And and that 
you know, one thing that I've seen just from the West Coast to really Florida, which is where my career has been, there there was always a mindset, a different mindset in the West Coast where it was growth at all costs. Now, I think the overall ecosystem in terms of technology has really kind of shifted more towards a path to profitability rather than growth at all costs. What are you telling your portfolio right now along those lines? I mean, is it preserve, hunker down, or is it figure out a balance between growth and, and preservation, or is it still grow at all costs? Uh, it's definitely not grow at all costs. Yeah. Um, my advice to all of the companies is, you know, in certain companies that aren't growing as fast and we, you know, we need the path to profitability. We have to get to break even as soon as possible. The money will not be there. Yeah. Um, and so that's probably the message for, you know, 90% of my portfolio companies. Um, and then, but you have a few, again, like the Hell Snap, where um, you still really do have to invest in growth just because the demand for the product is there. You can see the horizon and you do have to keep investing. But at the same time with, it, with you know, keeping your eye on the ball that you know that you have to get to a point like you at least have to understand what break even is, how you get there, and there are always, you know, there are always multiple levers that you can pull in a business in case something bad happens. So you have to have a really acute understanding of what those levers are and at what thresholds you have to apply them, so that you know, in the event that sales do dry up or whatever, there's a regulatory change or there's something that happens along the way that you know which levers you can pull to, you know, scale back on the growth scale back on expenses so that you can very quickly get to a cash flow neutral position. Yeah. Um, you know, there's lots of markets right now that are, that are seeing that, you know, real estate tech, you know, that's yeah. one of those areas where, Hey, you know, it's probably going to be a while. Just not much activity on yeah. the real estate side. So transactions yep. are down, volumes down, obviously yep. inherently their business, even a good, even good companies. Yeah, so, absolutely. You know? Yeah, no, it's interesting. And, we're seeing the same thing, right? And it's it's one of the one of the major things that I'm telling portfolio companies if if you are going to raise money and you think you can't successfully raise from a gross burn standpoint, you need to be able to have eighteen to twenty four months of runway Absolutely. because who right. knows what's gonna happen. Yep. You know. Uh, switching gears a little bit, over the last few years, uh, you've you've really made a dedicated push around branding, around uh, storytelling, branding, around getting your story out there. Can you talk a little bit about that decision around personal branding and how that has uh, affected your portfolio, your career, and um, negatives and positives? Branding is something that's top of mind right now for a lot of companies. I think trying to back to our other uh, back to the point prior, trying to see what can they do to to stay relevant, to stay alive in in one of these types of times. So, I would love to get your perspective there. Yeah, um, it really kind of boils down to um, <clears throat> it's. Just Funny because I was watching. I was. I did a deep dive on the uh, liquid death in the past few days, and the CEO, Super Mike, interesting, you know, it's very yeah, yeah, great, yeah. great, great, yeah. great stories. First ad was fifteen hundred dollars, three thousand dollars in marketing on Facebook ads, a hundred thousand dollars in sales for their first month. Ran out of product, you know. And his point, and and my point, like all why I did this several years ago is that um, it's hard to own anything. And, and business. It's hard mm -hmm. to own a space. Mm -hmm. The one thing that you can own is your own brand. Great that point. is yours. Great point. And so if you want to differentiate, if you want to, if you want to tell a story or you want to, um, if you want to rise or just, you know, like the most basic, just be different in a good way. You can control the messaging and you can control the narrative. Brand is the only way to do that. And, for me personally, you know, I locally, um, you know, I was, I had a decent brand because, you know, I had a couple exits here um, and people locally might know who Steve McDonald was. But as I went out and I started um, investing outside and I wanted to have good opportunities um, to invest, you know, create an opportunity for myself like you know, the Peter Thiel's or Eli Gills of the Gills of the world, um, where I'm invited to invest in the best deals, people, you know, I'm in Tampa, you yeah. know, now that's not as, but a few years ago when you started this, it was not, there was nothing, Tampa, right? of yeah, Tampa yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the only way for me to like rise above that, and it, it was to really create and own that brand. Yeah. And so, and, and own the, the messaging behind it. And that, you know, for the other th 
and it wasn't like I, I wanted to become a household name or anything, but in the instances where I was an investor, or I was on the board, um, I wanted to help the entrepreneurs when, when we went out for our series A or series B that, you know, they were able to go and get, as they were talking to higher quality investors that, and they see me on the cap table or they see me on the board of directors, like, well, who is that schmuck? I don't remember that guy, <laughs> you know? So at least, you know, the, the goal of that was to, you know, demonstrate credibility, yeah. demonstrate a track record so that when my portfolio companies went out, it's not, it's not, it's, a, you know, company success is, is a lot of little things, mm -hmm. right? And it's just one more little thing that where, how and where I can add value to my portfolio companies is my personal brand. Yeah. And it's another arrow in the quiver, right? Right. Uh, I, I love how you said that. And I think another thing around brand that is really true in venture capital and angel investing is the first thing that an entrepreneur is going to go and, and look up is the fund or the individual. And if there's nothing out there on that fund or individual, that's a red flag. Yeah. And so why not be proactive, have that great brand? I couldn't agree more. I think venture capital, as much as it's about doing due diligence and understanding the numbers and understanding the business, there's so much about being in the know, having a good brand and, and being in that tight knit circle. As much as venture capital has grown, it's still a very tight knit circle. Right. Yep. So, uh, Anything else to add today, Steve? No, Florida Fund is doing a great job. I'm Appreciate excited that. about the portfolio. It's it's been such a great ride to be a part of, of that, and you know the evolution of of the quality of companies that we have in our portfolio is you know super exciting. The the founders, you know, are great founders. It's you know just it's been a great ride, and I'm happy that I was you know, invited to be a part of that. So. Of course. And we're, <laughs> we're excited to have you back and excited to get you involved in the, the next chapter. So thanks for everything, Steve. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Saxon. Thank you all for being here today. This is the, the skin in the game pod. Uh, as Tom always says, if you're a founder, go to our website, apply online. It only takes about five minutes. We look at over a hundred deals a month. So absolutely want to, want to look at your opportunity. If you're an investor, would love to get you involved in one of our funds in the investor network. And until next time, uh, I'm Saxon Baum and we'll see you later. Thanks. Thanks for spending your time with skin in the game VC today. If you want to learn more about investing in early stage tech, like a venture capitalist, be sure to visit the Florida funders website, at floridafunders.com. Join our angel network at no cost and get access to Florida Funders VC vetted investment opportunities in the next great breakout tech companies.